Good afternoon, Lace Jumpin' Art John. This is many a true nerd, and welcome back to Fallout Tale of Two Wastelands. Where last time, we completed our incredibly stupid experiment into making my character as fast as they could possibly go. With the end result being this. This ridiculous hyperspeed crawl that I can now do, which is just R. Oh, it's so dumb, and I absolutely love it. Tragedy, though, it is impossible to just stay on a holiday forever because uh, there was uh, one small tiny issue that I probably ought to get back to. But on the way out, there is one thing I need to take care of, which is, um, yes, I'm probably not the first person this has happened to, but during my visit to Vegas, I may have run into some slight financial trouble. To be precise, I owe the game 12,000 caps I kind of borrowed from the future and the number of caps I've got on me is 46, so okay, I think I know precisely where we need to go to get that sorted out. Here we go, back to the penthouse of good old Mr. House, and uh, I love Mr. House and Tell of Two Wastelands, because uh, every time you speak to him in New Vegas, he's always got this, you know, I know better than you tone going on. Like, you can say to him, hey, not interested, and he'll just, you know, smugly state, oh yes, you'll be back sooner or later. Well, alright buddy, bad news for you, this is Tale of Two Wastelands, I can just hop in a train and naff off to the other side of America, which is precisely what I'm about to do. Events have transpired in a less than optimal fashion. Benny has fled the strip and the platinum chip has not been recovered. Honestly, buddy, not my problem. You have fun dealing with that. As I've told you before, you are contractually obligated to deliver the chip. Do your job. You have everything to gain. Oh yeah, your sniffy superior toad's not gonna work on me, buddy. I'm not here for that. I've got a much better way of getting paid. Number one, hilariously, House will pay significantly more for snow globes than he will for the platinum chip itself, and I'm pretty sure I've got one of those on me right now. You do? Why, that's just wonderful. I'll take it and put it with the rest of the collection. Okay, 2,000 caps. Good starting points. And as for the rest, oh my goodness. I may have, you know, stored a couple of bits and pieces I don't really need upstairs in the Lucky 38, meaning I've got plenty of space in my inventory for some light reading. In fact, I'm curious. I wonder if on this occasion I can actually clear the lad out of, you know, his really lovely book collection. Oh, there's only a tiny, tiny handful left. So if I was to put on my power armor at this point, that would get me up to... Oh, flip me. Okay, I'm a lot slower. Like, oh, I feel so slow. This feels really weird. I don't like it. No, seriously, this is horrible. It feels like I'm wading through treacle. Oh, this is. This is no good at all. But, 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 the point is, I've got every single book in a house's penthouse, leaving only the ones right here in the bedroom, though. Ooh. We're maybe 15, 20 pounds shy of a complete set. And I'm carrying a lot of buff out. So, okay, I may be about to get addicted to buff out. But honestly, does that matter? Like, I'm going to be able to carry 20 more books home with me. And uh, the price of treating addiction is way, way less than the value of a book. Oh, gosh darn it, we're still the tiniest bit short. Okay, we've still done really bloody well. Holy flip me, I don't know how much money this is, but this is going to be one a hell of a payday. Like, the Sierra Madre's got nothing on my local library. Right, those in a hand, see you later, you stupid giant TV loser. I'm going back to Fallout 3. And here we go, back to Union Station. Marvellous, and uh, to my mind, yeah, the moment we step through this door... There we go, back to Fallout 3 Green. Lovely. Okay, step one, I've got 150 pounds of books to sell, so straight back over to, here we go, the Arlington Library in Seriously, I do not know how much money this is about to be, but um, I suspect it's going to be a lot. Remember my offer, outsider. Cash, pre-war books. Oh, don't you worry. I have most definitely not forgotten. Here you flipping go, scribe yearling, because... Uh, Oh yeah, just uh, just take all of them. Don't worry about one or two. And uh, Very well. Here is your reward. well, isn't that is just well? absolutely cocky perfect? Like, 
pretty much bang on 12,000. I did not plan this. This just, you know, was meant to be. Right, whack up the old medicine a bit. Whack up explosives too. Lovely. And, uh, okay, we're getting into very high levels at this point. Okay, this doesn't have, like, an immediate place in my build or anything, but it would be remiss of me not to take this in what is blatantly, you know, a bit of a luck and crit build. Because uh, Laser Commander is one of the dumbest perks in the entire game, and I mean that in a very, very good way. So, uh, every single bit of laser weaponry, and some weapons that aren't lasers, because seriously, sometimes in this game, yes, classification is uh, an odd and inconsistent thing, 15% bonus damage, which is absolutely huge. And plus 10% chance to crit. That's another lovely flat 10% added on at the end of the calculation, just like that, just like light touch. And uh, that means, yes, rapid fire laser weaponry can be ridiculous in this game because uh, even if the critical chance is massively reduced, it just doesn't matter. Like, add all these flat percentages onto each other, you could just be getting a, a dumb amount of crits with, you know, rapid fire laser weaponry. Okay, I can't not take this. It just syncs up so well with a couple of weapons we may at some point get round to using. Now, problem number two. Just bear in mind, yes, I'm not actually this rich because 12,000 of those caps I owe to the universe. So we need to get rid of those. Now, obviously, I can't benefit from these caps, so, you know, buying things with them, that wouldn't be acceptable, and uh, just leaving them in the box, that doesn't feel right either. I need to actually give these away, and that's surprisingly difficult to do in Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. There are precious few people who will just, you know, take your money and not give you anything in return. Which is why I've made my way back to Rivet City, because yes, churches are one of the very small number of institutions in this game that will simply take your money as a donation. Two options, of course, you've got the Children of Atom in Megaton and the church right here in Rivet City, though, yes, Children of Atom seem a little bit more interested in maybe exploding bombs, dying, destroying the world, etc, etc. This church feels a bit more, you know, benevolent, in a way. And I appear to have stumbled in by sheer coincidence on a Sunday as everyone gathers to, you know, hear the sermon, though, um, going to be honest, buddy. You're kind of supposed to be at the front, giving the sermon. This is very embarrassing, but everyone's too embarrassed to say anything. The downside, however, is you've got to give your donations in increments of either 10, 50, or 100. Meaning, if I want to give this guy 12,000 caps, that means I'm going to need to speak to him 120 times. And I'm never going to be able to keep track of that. So, okay, I've just bought some lunch from Rivet City Marketplace, meaning... I don't need to get down to 2,588. If I'm below that when I'm done, then that means that we've done this correctly. I'm going to be honest though, I do feel a bit bad just standing in front of the entire city. Like, holding up their weekly service so I can just constantly hand over bigger and bigger piles of money to the local priest. It kind of just feels like I'm just showing off. This is very much performative charity right here. Okay, we're down to 1,888, so I may have gone slightly overboard and pressed A a few too many times, uh, but honestly, uh, let's just call that interest from borrowing from the future, and, uh, okay, I suspect there's going to be messages uh, popping up in the top left for quite some time to come, potentially. Still, bare minimum, I do have, you know, plenty of spare change left over. Which is good, because I did end up, yes, just the tiniest bit addicted to a buff out from carrying around all my books. So, I bet the doctor was just in the church, wasn't he? Bloody useless. So, that's me, 12,000 caps poorer, and having given all that money to, yes, the good old Father Clifford, I fully expect to see an entire cathedral built on the front of the boat next time I pass by, though, um, yes. This has created one other additional problem I now have to deal with, which is uh, when you give money to the church, the game considers this a moral good. In particular, one cap is equivalent to one point of karma, meaning, um, yes, as a result of that, I am now the most morally good person in the world. And I do mean that very literally. Like, I am as good as it's possible for a human being to be, plus a thousand to karma, and uh, that's a bit of a problem. Because I took the perk in Partial Mediation. Brilliant perk, but it does mean you need to stay neutral. Plus, being neutral does mean you don't get attacked by Talon Company, etc. So, uh, yes. Ideally, I need to get my neutrality back. But 
as I was just saying, I'm now the most good person in the world, meaning I really would need to find something catastrophically evil to do if I wanted to restore my neutrality. Oh, now that would do nicely. Oh, and outside the citadel, here we go. The giant barriers have been set up, yeah. The world is ready for the final showdown, so let's get in there and make this happen. Oh yeah, I definitely get the feeling that uh, stuff is going down right here in the citadel, so let's go and have a chat with good old lions. So, you're back. We had feared both you and the Gek were lost. Were you successful? This conversation with Elder Lions is really rather peculiar though, because yes, it's an incredibly rushed conversation. Sure, you can tell him that you found the Gek, or at least, you know, know of its location as the Enclave now has it. If you have any other information, tell me now before we mobilize. Any help you can give might save lives. But yes indeed, he's really not flippy kidding. This guy is now in a bloody rush, which is, uh, you can tell him one, and uh, only one thing. After you tell him this, he's basically just going to break off the conversation and go and deal with his own business. So you can only tell him one piece of information and you can't come back later and tell him anything you don't tell him right now. So, okay, the top option is telling him about the modified FEV, which also involves handing it over so it can be destroyed. We don't want to do that because, yes indeed, I've got alternative plans for that lovely vial. Instead, let's focus on, yes, either the civil war going on inside the Enclave between Eden and Autumn, or alternatively, they can't turn the damn thing on because I didn't give them the codes. Well, that gives us a little more time. But how long do we have before they figure it out? This makes this situation far more dire. And there we go. He now just doesn't care about the FEV anymore. You just can't tell him about it. Oh, and here we flippy go. Liberty Prime is on the cocking move. Up it goes into the courtyard. Okay, here we go. Take it back begins. Let's go get ourselves a purifier. Though as we just nip outside, yes, there's one really lovely touch about Prime I do rather enjoy. Which is, here we go, just keep your eyes on Prime as they lift her outside on the crane. And in just a second, I do enjoy that they just sort of bang the robot into the side of the citadel. And, you know, knock a bit of their own fortress over. That's just lovely. Before, yes, realising maybe he ought to be a little bit higher up. That's just great. So, whoever's up in that cab, yeah, possibly not getting a good write-up this year. And out we go as all of a sudden the fire starts to come down, the robot starts moving, the giant gate opens up and, uh, yes, things are about to start getting warring. Though don't you worry because, yes, we've got Liberty Prime on our side and uh, I can't help but rather enjoy Take It Back. Like, okay, fine. Basically, you are just walking from point A to point B, but... Given in how many video games, the final level could just be, you know, a ridiculously unfair grind. The fact that this one is actually, you know, quite frankly, the opposite. You just need to follow your giant nuclear robot as he basically wins the entire fight by himself. I can't help but find that a little bit enjoyable in its own way. And speaking of my giant nuclear robot, do um, yes, be a tiny bit careful of this guy because... Uh, Prime is sometimes a little bit, yes, not too fast with uh, who he's actually attacking at any given moment. So uh, if you accidentally take out a member of the Pride, say, you know, friendly fire, bit of splash damage, explosives, etc, etc. Prime will decide uh, you are an enemy. He will turn on you. He will absolutely cocky destroy you. And that's just one of various people that Prime will absolutely cocking annihilate if the opportunity presents itself. Like, for example, if you've got Forks with you and you dismiss him, well, that's an unaccompanied super mutant. So Prime will absolutely tear him apart. And if any poor caravans just happen to be, you know, passing by on their routine, yes, Prime doesn't like capitalism, which is weird given all the stuff he says about America and capitalism and diddly diddly dee. But no, if he sees a trader just going about his business, Prime will absolutely destroy that bastard. 
Oh, and just in case you've ever wondered, by the way, what happens if at this point you just, you know, completely abandon the Brotherhood and decide, uh, nah, I can't be bothered with this right now. I'm going to go on a hangout in Oasis because, you know, lovely, leafy, nice people over there. Nice place to spend an afternoon. Um, yes, you can. The game doesn't restrict fast travel or anything in any way whatsoever. You can just wander off if you want. Oh, you see, now look at that. Just such a lovely place to spend the day. Fallout being Fallout, though, this isn't something I would recommend doing because, um, yes, if you kind of, you know, walk away from a very much scripted set piece, Fallout 3 could get a bit, um, weird, actually. Here we go, back to the Citadel, having fast travel back after my lovely day out, and uh, now it's kind of a coin flip as to whether or not- Oh! Today we've been lucky, marvellous, no one seems to have despawned. Sometimes uh, Sarah just goes missing. Alright, I've seen Sarah just disappear out the game, catching up with you much, much later. Much more worryingly though, yes, if you spend too much time away from the set piece, occasionally Liberty Prime disappears. That one's a bit more problematic, so uh, yes, maybe just escort Liberty Prime to where he needs to go, just so he doesn't have a strop and then disappear. But instead today, how about yes indeed? We just let Liberty Prime do its business and, you know, follow it as the game instructs, though. If you can, do help out, because uh, while Liberty Prime is invincible, and Liberty Prime is in fact invincible, yes, you may notice you can't even vax it, though, funnily enough, it does actually have a health counter if you look at the game's files. And that number is 5 million hit points. The same number of hit points that it's got in Fallout 4. Though, yes, those numbers are just for show. You can't wear it down with, like, you know, God Mode turned on, Infinite Ammo turned on, etc, etc. There is no way to kill Liberty Prime aside from messing with console commands. The rest of Lion's Pride, however, they are very much killable. They're not even essential during this section. So, yes, keep them alive if you can, because they will show up again in Broken Steel. Unless, of course, you know, you mess up and they die right now. In which case, they're not coming back. So, I'm going to be going ahead with my ridiculous mega speed to do what I can to assist. Because I've got a new toy to try out in particular. No, not those guys. My pulse gun. Guaranteed damage against anyone wearing power armor. So, okay, you buddy. You may seem nice and tough, and Vance may not be impressed with the amount of damage I'm about to do, because Vance is just recording the gun's base damage. It's not acknowledging the EMP. So, actually... Okay, that was actually Prime. Okay, Prime, stop shooting for a second. Please stop shooting. I want to see how powerful this gun is without you getting involved. So here we go. And oh, look at that. All right. Hellfire Trooper. A hundred damage odd per shot. Guaranteed. Though. Okay. Me and Prime. Oh, blimey. Okay. There was, there was just a slight explosion there. I was caught in a... One small explosion, I'll admit. Just need a little bit of, you know, quick doctor bag and whatnot. Okay, iBot, you do not want to mess with me, okay? I'm doing 250 damage flat with every hit to you stupid bastards. Just keep firing. This thing is a bit on the slow side, by the way. It does it eat ammo, like uh, five ammo with every single shot. So uh, just keep on shooting. Flat damage, so it really doesn't matter where you shoot them. Like, there's no point going for headshot. You may as well go for torso, because uh, it's just flat damage anyway. And there we go. You just die, because you made the bad decision to wear power armor. Lovely. So, uh, you know, I'm actually pretty sure that it was... Stop shooting me or exploding me in the arm and... Oh, do we have a bug here? Prime? Feeling okay, buddy? Prime's not feeling okay. I'm going to try and draw some attention over in this direction. Because if we're lucky, that might... Guys, I'm literally shooting you in the back right now. I'm shooting your guns. There we go. Okay, they're now shooting in this direction. Prime? I'm being shot at by these guys. Would you like to maybe assist with this? Bloody Prime. Okay, never mind. I take back what I said about liking this section. Like, conceptually, I like the idea of, you know, a section where just for once in the final level of a game, you just get to do a grand epic victory lap. But no, this bloody robot does break a lot, I can't deny. I feel like the robot is just punishing me for my little day trip to Oasis in the alternative universe right now. That's what's going on. 
Honestly, I think I'm mainly messed with him by running ahead and trying to get some kills of my own. Like, I've just hung back on this occasion, let him do his own business, and he's doing it much, much better. Also, I do just enjoy that, like, you know, he doesn't fire his nukes out of a cannon. He just grabs them off his backpack and just tosses them at the enemy. That's just marvelous. Oh, seriously, it's just so nice to melt these Hellfire Troopers like this. Just being able to take down a Hellfire Trooper in a single VATS round. The pulse gun is just beautiful. Just the sexiest thing. And uh, as a result of that, Lion's Pride is doing very, very well. Though kind of backing off a bit at the moment. Okay, just pathfinding in general. Between the robot and, you know, Lion's Pride. It's always going to be a bit on the tricky side. You've completely walked past someone, which is marvellous. There's another Hellfire Trooper. Just shoot him in the back right over there. No trouble with you, buddy. Once again, just take the easiest shot. There's no reason to go for that, John. You're going for the one thing that's 90%. You've got 95 on the head. Take it and just nothing will work better than this. Like, I don't know, maybe explosive rounds in the anti-material rifle might do a tiny bit better, but seriously, the pulse gun in the right scenario, though it looks like a tiny, tiny handgun, and the numbers on the gun are pathetic. Oh yeah, in the right scenario, robots and power armor, this thing is an absolute menace, I love it. Oh, and here we go, because I didn't hand over, yes, the lovely FEV vial to, uh, yes, my good friend Delta Lions. I've now picked up Project Impurity, the variant of this quest, where potentially you could poison the water for everybody, forever, and, um, yes, indeed. As I say, that might be something I'm rather interested in doing, because it does open up some interesting things in Broken Steel. Anyway, music seems to have calmed down, which is beautiful, so yes indeed, the robot's made it, it's got us to the gift store entrance, we're ready to go inside. Though, fun fact by the way, if you now decide, you know, you're just going to take your time and... It was just a critical strike on a Hellfire Trooper. I mean, it wasn't me, so I'm not sure who did that. But yes, if you decide to just take your time and don't bother going inside immediately, reinforcements will occasionally just rock up. Though, yes, you do still have Prime, though... I was about to say, Prime will help you out with that. He doesn't seem to be... There we go! He's realised he's supposed to be taking out the Enclave. Well done, Prime. Good job. So yeah, if you just hang around outside, don't bother going inside in a hurry. Reinforcements will occasionally pile in. But uh, yes, Prime will help you out with that. It's not going to be a problem. Okay, I'd say it's probably time we moseyed on in and wrapped up this whole Fallout 3 base game business. Though yes, now we're done with the pure spectacle outside, uh, I can't deny. I'm not sure anyone's ever going to, you know, massively defend the end of the Fallout 3 base game. Just this very tiny area leading up to the Rotund in just a second. Uh, hey there, buddy. Don't you mind me. Just going to, uh, yes, be popping you in the head with the pulse gun. Three shots. Dead. Lovely. I mean, you know, the basic troopers, like the Hellfire troopers might be able to do something. But the basic troopers, are uh, not a chance. Okay, you guys are just falling apart. Yeah, the ending of Fallout 3 has always been a bit of a damn squib. Now, obviously, Broken Steel did modify it, but in many ways that just sort of made it even more bloody confusing. Just to uh, finish off our handful more Enclave soldiers while we're swinging through. Gonna be barely more than like, you know, four, six or something guarding this area. Three shots will take them down as long as they're the basics. This is not going to be a problem. And yeah, you can see that even if I'm shooting for the leg, it just doesn't matter because it's flat damage. A really nice thing about, yes, the bonus damage guns, uh, where the damage isn't coming from the gun itself, it's just coming from flat bonus damage. Because uh, when you've got those, uh, it simply doesn't matter where you hit your target. If the arm or leg is the most exposed, uh, go for it. It's going to do precisely the same. And also, uh, hello up there, buddy. There we go. I think he's realized where he are. The only downside being it means you can't use optimized or maximized ammo to increase the power. So all that does is boost the base power, not the bonus power. So yeah, a bit underwhelming in that regard. But then again, in all fairness, the base power, as you can see, is spectacular against power armor. And against robots, it's like twice as good. So yeah, I'm not going to complain about that. What I'm going to complain about, though, is autumn because... Uh, oh, autumn. Okay, let's go and have a chat with you and wrap up this nonsense. The way I've set up this playthrough, though, to my mind, does give yes. Autumn, the best dialogue he's got out of not a great selection. So just, uh, mosey on round the corner. 
you again. I can't say I'm surprised. You and your ilk seem hell-bent on destroying everything our government has worked to achieve. There's nothing to stop me from killing you this time. Let's end this. No, 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 Autumn. We're going to have a lovely chat, actually. So, here's the funny old thing about Colonel Autumn, which is uh, the vast majority of people, when they confront him, will see two speech options available, one of which is much easier than the other. The reason I've only got one, and it's relatively difficult, even with my speech I'm only seeing 46%, is because I haven't destroyed Raven Rock. That's one of the rather fun things about this conversation. It's affected not just by your charisma and by your speech, but instead by external factors. So the fact Raven Rock hasn't been destroyed means uh, it's a lot more difficult to talk Colonel Autumn down. For the simple reason that, you know, he's got a giant base that he can just go back to after we're done. So he feels relatively secure right now. Obviously, you know, had I destroyed the base, it would put him in a weaker position. Maybe he'd be more willing to cut a deal. So uh, the vast majority of times uh, when, you know, you see this conversation or if you play through it yourself, people go for the easiest speech check, which is a shame. It's way, way weaker. It's basically just you saying, hey, maybe like, you know, give up. And he says, why should I? And you say, because I'm speech checking you. And then he just sort of walks away. The harder speech check that's always available, but yes, just because it's harder, most people don't go for it, is much more interesting. Because yes, this is the option where you actually start tearing his world apart. Though I managed to, yes, re-roll this conversation a couple of times to actually make it trigger correctly. So yes, how about we talk about Eden? Because Eden is not dead. He's alive. I left him alive. He's fine. So Autumn, let's chat about that machine you take orders from. I am sworn to protect the presidency. The chain of command must be upheld. I wouldn't expect you to understand. Oh, quite the contrary, Autumn. I understand very well indeed. I understand that Eden betrayed you and gave me the vial because you couldn't be trusted anymore and I'm basically about to steal your job. He likes me more than he likes you. I'm his new best friends. You're in over your head. And no amount of talking is going to get you out of it. Oh, we'll see what my magical time-traveling powers have to say about that. Also, John, you literally have great mentats. Just use the great mentats. Oh, now doesn't that look much, much better? That's not true. That plan was abandoned months ago. He would never go behind my back. You see, I just love this option way, way more because it makes a lot more sense that this might be a way you tear down Colonel Autumn's worldview. Make him realize that basically he's been pushed out. Eden's kept him out of the loop. He's sent other agents to basically go and put a brand new plan into position. In fact, I'm the one acting on behalf of the Enclave. I'm about to enact a much worse, more evil plan than you were planning to. And I'm going to do it on Eden's orders because it turns out I'm the real bad guy all along. Because you, buddy, you are too weak to do what the president wanted you to do. You could have stolen the vial. It means nothing. It proves nothing. And you know I'm telling you the truth. Eden, the Enclave, both have betrayed you. This is just such a better conversation than the much easier one. Because you are just tearing this guy's world down around him. It kind of makes sense that this might rattle him significantly more. I am in charge here. I am the Enclave. And there's even a hint as to, yes, a much more sensible reason as to why Autumn might leave. If you're in charge, you can stop the plans of some mad machine. I.e., you know, go back to Raven Rock, which is still standing. Go and deal with Eden. How about you just go and take care of that? If you're really in charge, go and prove it and take command at Raven Rock. So, yeah, just to my mind, this conversation makes a whole lot more sense for Colonel Autumn than the one the vast majority of people see. Which is, yes, the easiest speech check, but by far the weaker dialogue. So... Okay, Autumn, I've done the best I can to defend this very flimsy conversation. Off you go, have fun. And there we go, off he pops. Though, of course, yes, there is a bit more to do yet. Dr. Lee, it's Sarah Lyons. I'm in the control room. We're both here. What's going on? I've been monitoring the equipment remotely, and we have a serious problem. The facility has been damaged during the fighting. Some of it looks accidental, some of it may have been sabotage. There's pressure building up in the holding tanks. It needs to be released now, or else the whole facility could explode. To release the pressure, you're going to have to turn the purifier on. Do you understand me? It has to be turned on now! If I'm reading this right, I'm afraid there are lethal levels of radiation inside the chamber. I'm sorry. 
I wish there were some other way, but there's just no time. It has to be done now, or the damage will be catastrophic. Well, so much for celebrating. One of us is going to have to go in there and turn the damn thing on. And whoever does it isn't coming back out. Not exactly how I imagined going out, you know? So, what should we do? Draw straws? So, funny old thing about that, Sarah, which is, okay, bloody hell. Where to start with this discussion, which is, number one, fun fact. Right now, time is frozen because in Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas, time freezes during discussions. Though, if you come out to this conversation and basically refuse to do anything, there is genuinely a time limit. There's an unconventional game over in Fallout 3 where you simply don't do anything and the thing explodes. And obviously Sarah's dialogue here was basically written when this was indeed the only option. Where you had to go in or she had to go in. The good option, self-sacrifice. The bad option, Sarah goes in instead. Even in the event that you had companions standing by and uh, hilariously yes of course when Fallout 3 originally came out those companions refused to go in. Even though the problem in the room was uh, a large amount of radiation and uh, in what was just, you know, such a hilarious turn, I almost think someone planned it intentionally. About half of your companions are immune to radiation. You've got a super mutant. You've got a ghoul. You've got a robot. They would all come up with reasons why they just didn't want to. Fox just kind of felt it was your destiny. Charon just decided he didn't feel like it. Even though his entire thing was, uh, if you're holding his contract, he can't disobey a direct order. He's got to do what you tell him, unless what you tell him is uh, go in there and push three buttons, in which case I guess he sort of just doesn't have to. And RL3 is a robot. They kind of have to follow orders, or at least I hope they do. Otherwise, uh, arguably, we've got bigger problems than the Enclave. And then, of course, Broken Steel came out and changed all that, adding post-game and also adding a significant expansion to the ending of Fallout 3, where all of a sudden, you could tell your companions to go into the room to turn on the purifier, which makes a huge amount of sense, because it means neither you or Sarah have to die. You just send in someone who is immune to radiation, they turn it on, everybody gets to live. Which sounds really good, but then during the ending, the game yells at you anyway, specifically calling you out for not understanding the meaning of sacrifice, of being a coward, etc, etc, and uh, I've always assumed, though I can't prove it, that this was simply because they couldn't get Ron Perlman back in to re-record some new endings. So all they had was the original ending slide, uh, where Ron Perlman either says, you're great because you sacrificed yourself, or you suck because you sacrificed Sarah. But yes, in a scenario where you can send in a super mutant, that line doesn't really make sense anymore. But they didn't record any new actual ending slide audio to go with the addition of Broken Steel's new let the companions do the ending bit because, oh blimey, Broken Steel. I mean, it improved the ending in some ways, but it made a bit of a mess while it was doing it. Still, we've not got anyone like that here today, and as I was just saying a second ago, I've got some karma to get rid of. So, basically, no way am I going in there. You do it, you stupid loser. And this is actually the only way to get anybody killed during the end of the game, now that we've got broken steel. Because if you go in, you were kind of supposed to die originally. Like, you know, game begins with you being born, ends with you dying. But now, thanks to broken steel, starts with you being born... Ends with you choosing to die, but then waking up some weeks later and it turns out you're fine, actually. Like, you know, Dr. Lee was just wrong. The radiation inside her, not lethal at all. Which is definitely true, because, you know, Colonel Autumn survived being in there with the radiation. So I'm sure it's all fine, actually. But yes, if you send Sarah in, she does actually die. It's the only way to actually get somebody killed. So, start you mean to go on, because, uh, yes... We're going to be killing a lot of people with the decision I'm about to make. You're going in there, you bloody do it. Fine, I'll do it. But I need the code. And even more hilariously, you can just basically refuse to cocky tell her the codes. What? Are you out of your mind? We'll both die if this thing doesn't get turned on. Who knows how many other people will die too? Give me the damn code! And fine, screw it, let's all just burn into hell, because, okay, I just enjoy that there is this one path through the ending where you can just be an absolute dick for no reason whatsoever and condemn everybody to die. You can't do this. Give me the code. Don't let things end like this. Not now. Not after all we've been through. You have to give me that code. If you won't turn this thing on, you have to at least let me do it. And no, I'm not cocky doing it. How can you do this? 
Seriously, they recorded like so many lines of dialogue for you just being a dick over and over again to Sarah. It's marvelous. Please tell me the code. If you don't activate the purifier right now, you're all going to die. Oh, and here we go. And that's how the game ends with a giant explosion. But the Lone Wanderer refused to surrender to the vices that had claimed so many others. The values passed on from father to child. Selflessness, compassion, honor guided this noble soul through countless trials and triumphs. And hilariously it's given me the happy high karma ending simply because, yes, like at the end of the game, I had high karma and it had no other information to go off. So even though I just blew up the purifier and condemned everyone to dirty water forever, yes, the game's saying I'm a massive hero because... Seriously, the ending to Fallout 3 is such a delightful mess. And we're back, because yes, doing that is also literally the only way to not move forward into Broken Steel. Otherwise, every other option, sending in Companion, sending in yourself, sending in Sarah, they all lead into Broken Steel. Only way to avoid that is to just blow up Project Purity. But uh, no, 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 no. We're going to be doing something else. Do you wish to add any chemicals to the system? Why, yes. Yes, I flippy do. I want to insert the modified FEV virus, and uh, the reason I want to do this is because, uh, yes, right now I'm very morally good, uh, and this is the joint most evil action in the game, at minus 1000, which will get me straight back down from as good as you could be to true neutrality. Though fascinatingly, yes, like, I'm still not going to be evil. Okay, like giving 12,000 caps to the church, that's about equivalent to poisoning the water supply with the genocide water forever. That's what we're going to do right now, but um, yes, funny old thing, if you sacrifice yourself to turn the machine on, it's the joint most morally good option in the game. And you may notice, those two things aren't mutually exclusive, meaning I can put the genocide water into Project Purity, meaning it's going to kill everyone, and the game says, oh, that's bad, we're going to take away karma. And then you sacrifice your life to turn on what's now the genocide machine, and the game gives you karma, because sacrificing yourself in order to turn it on is an inherent moral good. Alright, Ron Perlman is just super into self-sacrifice, so if you kill yourself, or like try to, because in Broken Steel you're gonna wake up anyway, you're gonna get all that karma straight back again. Meaning, giving your life in order to kill everybody is the behaviour of the most morally good person that can ever exist, because Fallout 3 karma is just the best. But we're not going to be doing that because I don't want to get that karma back, all right? We're just going to insert the virus. That's worth minus a thousand karma. And then we're going to have a nice chat with Sarah Lyons as we complete Project Impurity. Beautiful. Hey, you have to give me that code. And this time I am going to give her the code. In you go, Sarah. Have fun. Okay, let's get this over with. Cycle the airlock, will you? So just cycle the airlock and... In a she flipping Moses in just a second. Why haven't you started the purifier? Don't worry, Please, Dr. Lee, do we're now. doing it, all right? She's just doing a very slow, dramatic walk. Sorry about that. If and uh, just right a second, now, uh, the purifier die. comes on and uh, I get to live. There's a bit more karma going down. Sure, why not? Who cares? And I think Sarah Lines is doing a dramatic death, but unfortunately she's being slightly obscured by the airlock controls there, so that's a bit of a shame. Anyway, let's get ourselves an ending. And so it was that the lone wanderer ventured forth from Vault 101, intent on discovering the fate of a father who had once sacrificed the future of humanity for that of his only child. The Capital Wasteland proved a cruel, inhospitable place. Hilariously, there's no audio for neutral characters. Good characters get praised, bad characters get condemned, neutral characters get really awkward silence. It was not until the end of this long road that the Lone Wanderer was faced with that greatest of virtues, sacrifice. But the child refused to follow the father's selfless example. Instead, allowing a true hero to venture into the irradiated control chamber of Project Purity and sacrifice her own life for the greater good of mankind. 
Sadly, when selected by the sinister president to be his instrument of annihilation, the Wanderer agreed. Humanity would be preserved, but only in its purest form. The waters of life flowed at last, but the virus contained within soon eradicated all those deemed unworthy of salvation. The capital wasteland, despite its progress, became a graveyard. So ends the story of the Lone Wanderer, who stepped through the great door of Vault 101 and into the annals of legend. But the tale of humanity will never come to a close, for the struggle of survival is a war without end. And war, war never changes. Now, you may have just noticed, by the way, how according to that ending, a lot of people ended up dead. Rivet City, completely wiped out. Underworld, completely wiped out. Though curiously, yes, like Canterbury Common seemed to be doing okay. As apparently did Arafu, despite the fact I wiped out Arafu personally. But um, let's just say that's not actually true. The ending is just lying. But we'll get to that in just a second. Easy now, take it slow. Don't move too quickly. It's all right, you're in the Citadel now. Relax. I was starting to think you might never wake up, despite assurances to the contrary. It's good to see you on your feet again. And there we flipping go, I'm apparently A-OK -okay in the post-game in Broken Steel, and uh, hilariously, yes, no one asked too many questions about what happened with Sarah, about me being a complete dick to her, and then making her sacrifice herself and then sort of refusing to give her the code, just because it struck me as amusing. It's all right. I understand. I have no doubt she refused to allow you to put yourself in harm's way. We all owe her a great debt. And I... I could not be prouder. So, yes indeed, let's just say that's what happened, Lines. That's fine, absolutely A-OK. -okay. Though, um, yes, while I've been out for two weeks, a couple of things have been happening. After securing the Purifier, our forces were sent to deal with the Enclave in full. The Pride and Liberty Prime made short work of their base of operations, and have since been cleaning up pockets of resistance. So unfortunately, yes, even if you choose to leave Ravenrock standing, it still ends up destroyed, because officially, if you didn't destroy it, Liberty Prime did off-screen between the main game and the beginning of Broken Steel. So even if you do everything he didn't ask you to, you can't go back and ask to join the Enclave or become his number two or whatever, because yes, quite simply, he's dead at this point. Prime already exploded him. And there we go, we're now free to crack on with the Brotherhood business, though the world has most certainly changed, including giant barrels everywhere of Aqua Pura, though, um, funny old thing. The Aqua Pura is not so pure, though. How about we call it apart there and pick up, yes, what's changed around the world next week, and also what it means that I've just kind of poisoned the water supply for everybody forever, because that comes with, yes, certain consequences for various people, various societies, and for me myself as it turns out. And most importantly of all, I'm back to neutral karma, so okay I've got my speech back and I've got rid of all that stupid goody two-shoes energy. So, as I say, join me next week as we investigate what it means to poison literally the entire wasteland. So, hopefully you join me next time for that. But in the meantime, I've been John, this has been many a true nerd, and this has been Fallout, Tale of Two Wastelands. Thank you very much, and goodbye. If we just hide the bodies, nobody needs to know about this. Yes! My stupid, stupid plan has worked! It turns out I'm a genius! The giant rat scorpion is not gone! Oh, hang on, there's, there's more yet, though. I'm still being very shocked. Guys, where's the NCR? Nobody needs to know.